Welcome everyone to the last webinar in our 2018 series. I'm Nellie Gontier, Education and Training Specialist for Parkinson Canada. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on incontinence and voiding dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Sydney, Sydney Radomsky, who will be sharing with us his expertise on Parkinson's disease and how it can affect voiding function in both men and women. This can have a debilitating effect on individuals. His presentation will discuss techniques for the management of voiding to help alleviate some of the impact and improve quality of life. Dr. Radomsky is a professor of surgery urology at the University of Toronto and works at Toronto Western Hospital, a member facility of the University Health Network, where he's the director of Eurodynamics Laboratory. He graduated from U of T Faculty of Medicine in 1984, where he got his training in urology. The focus of his fellowship, done at both the University of Toronto and the University of California at Davis, included voiding dysfunction, urodynamics, and genitourinary prostheses. His clinical and research interests are in the areas of erectile and voiding dysfunctions, incontinence, prostate diseases, and neurodynamics. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Synovian, for making this webinar session possible through an unrestricted educational grant. I'd also like to take this opportunity to inform everyone that today's session is being recorded for future viewing. You'll be able to access the recording by visiting our website at www.parkinson.ca or by visiting our YouTube channel, The Knowledge Network. To report any technical issues at any time during the webinar, please go to the menu at the right of your screen. To open and close this menu, click on the red tab. Use the To Admin button at the bottom of the menu. Clicking this will bring up a pop-up menu and you can ask a question and submit your request. We ask that questions be reserved for the end of the presentation, at which time our speaker will answer them. Please ask questions that are of a general nature and are not intended to obtain medical advice. We'll make every effort to answer all questions at that time. And with that, please join me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Radomsky. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and make this as practical as possible because this is a uh, you know, many times along with the Parkinson's a disease process, the voiding dysfunction can be quite troublesome for most patients. And I'm going to try and make it easy for most people to understand what we can do to help people. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So here are my disclosures. I'm on the advisory board of a number of companies that deal with voiding dysfunction. We've done a number of research studies with Estellas and Allergan, and I speak for Pfizer on some occasion. So I'd like to just go over the a simplistic a, a portion of the anatomy. This is about as simplistic as you can get. So the bladder itself is a compliant, and what that means is it accommodates fluid easily as it fills and the pressure doesn't go up. It's a smooth muscle reservoir, and its uh, nerve innervation is something called cholinergic innervation. Uh, and those are, medica those are uh, nerves that make the bladder squeeze. Interesting, over the last number of years, we've also found out that there's uh, a new innervation. It's not so much new, but treatment that we can use, and that's something called beta adrenergic receptors. And some of you may have heard of a drug called Mirabetric, and that's what that's based on. There are two smooth mu there are two sphincters. One is a smooth muscle sphincter that works at the bladder neck, and there's a second muscle, which is the external sphincter. So that's the muscle when the phone rings and you're urinating in the bathroom and you want to catch the phone, you can actually squeeze that muscle. The muscle of the bladder neck is a lot more difficult to control and many times it's, it's not under voluntary control. The neurological aspect of the bladder is very important for Parkinson's and the reason is very simple. There is the cortex or the brain itself and that's where Parkinson's has an effect. There's something called the pontine micturation center, the PMC, and that basically drives the bladder to relax or squeeze. And the brain itself, what it does is simply control, it's a higher level of control over this PMC. So with Parkinson's disease, or if you have a stroke or even Alzheimer's, the cortex doesn't have that control and doesn't control this uh, engine or PMC or uh, area that controls voiding and relaxation. 
And again, you have these parasympathetic nerves in the spinal cord and also the sympathetic nerves that are affecting continence and then the pudendal nerve which avoids or functions to control the sphincter. And of course, we have sensory nerves that tell us when the bladder is filled, stretched, etc. This is all just a prelude as to how we deal with this problem. So here are some of the common terms I'm going to use during today's talk. One is LUTs, and you may have heard that term. It's uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, overactive bladder or OAB, BPH is benign, prostatic hyperplasia, PVR or post void residual. The five ARIs are the five alpha reductase inhibitors such as finasteride or um, dutestride. The other names are Proscar and Avidar. You may have familiar with that. The PD-5 inhibitors, drugs such as sildenafil, Cialis, Viagra, etc., bladder outlet obstruction, and a TRP, which is a transurethral resection of the prostate gland. Now, interestingly, Parkinson's affects the bladder of both men and women. The problem is that in men who are older, the prostate gland plays a role. And that confounds things. So if you look at just storage symptoms, that orange box, which is overactive bladder, women typically get this, and so do men who have Parkinson's disease. So you get altered bladder sensation, increased daytime frequency, nocturia or getting up at night, urgency and urge leakage when we'll talk about what those exactly mean. And then the problem is that in men who are older, who have enlarged the prostate, you get these added bonus symptoms, as I call them, hesitancy, intermittency, slow stream, again, the getting up at nighttime, straining to urinate, terminal dribbling, a feeling that you're not emptying adequately. So that's our dilemma. The dilemma is that in women, we can treat them with bladder relaxants, and we can, we're going to talk about that. In men, we have this added problem of treating the enlargement of the prostate along with that. So what is overactive bladder? Well, believe it or not, it's funny how overactive bladder came to bed. It was a terminology that was coined by a drug company, which uh, was Pharmacia, who was eventually bought over by Pfizer. And everybody in the uh, Eurodynamic Society or the intellectual group, as we call ourselves, we felt that this was a bad term. It was a drug company term. And sure enough, over five to 10 years, we had a change of heart. We said, huh, it's not such a bad term, overactive bladder. And it means simply urgency with or without urgent continence, usually associated with frequency nocturia. Interestingly, when you take all comers, the leakage part is not as common as just the frequency and urgency. So what is urgency? Urgency is a sudden, compelling desire to avoid that is difficult to defer. Urgent continence is if you can't defer it, you may actually leak. Frequency, people always frequently ask me, you know, what's normal? How many times a day is normal? Well, less than eight times over 24 hours is normal. How many times can I be getting up or should I be getting up? Well, it's believed that one time per night or less is considered normal. If you're younger, zero times per night is normal. If you're over the age of 45, getting up once is considered normal. So that's in the eight less than eight times per day category. So if you go seven times during the day and maybe once at night, that isn't so bad. It's within reasonable uh, um, um, factor. So here are the general principles. If you have a lesion, such as a stroke, Parkinson's, that occurs above the brainstem, so in the, in the cortex of the brain, you get bladder spasms or an overactive bladder. The sphincter muscles work in coordination, and sensation usually is okay. Occasionally, you get decreased sensation. And on a rare occasion, the bladder itself can't squeeze properly. Usually, that uh, usually occurs not very often in Parkinson's, but more in patients who've had a stroke, an initial response. So what about Parkinson's disease in particular? Interestingly, 35 to 75, 70 percent of patients have voiding dysfunction. They have urgency, frequency, nocturia, and urge leakage. They have an uh, overactive bladder, but the muscles are, are, are synergistic. In other words, when your bladder contracts, the urethra relaxes so you can urinate. The problem in Parkinson's disease is you get something called pseudodysynergia or bradykinesia. And what that is, is the same thing that happens to skeletal muscles. The patients freeze, 
the urethra itself doesn't relax normally rapidly. It may take time for it to relax. So it's not truly a dyssynergia, but rather the urethra just doesn't relax quickly enough. We call that sphincter bradykinesia, and so sometimes you can be fooled into thinking something else, but that can happen. And again, a flaccid bladder is not common in um, Parkinson's disease. So this is a typical, I always like to put this up, so this is what I spent all my years training to do, is something called the urodynamic raft. And I'm going to put my, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but normally this is what's called the beat to truser. So this is the bladder pressure within the bladder itself and the bladder muscle contracting. And you can see halfway down the graph, you see these terrible elevations in bladder pressure. It should be a flat line till you're ready to urinate. And this is what we mean by a bladder spasm. And that's what gives people frequency urgency. Very common in Parkinson's disease. It's not uncommon in women who don't have Parkinson's disease or even men. But that's what we're referring to. Now, what about something called multisystem atrophy, sort of a uh, version of Parkinson's disease, a more severe version? And a, a, as many of you know, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And urologists, when I was training in the you know early 90s and late 80s, they used to, in our textbooks, it used to be called Shy Drager syndrome. Now it's just called multisystem atrophy. And interestingly, the bladder symptoms occur much earlier than Parkinson's disease proper, and they're often more severe, and you can also get erectile dysfunction. What's very unique to MSA and is not the same in Parkinson's is that you can get something called orthostatic hypotension. Why is that important? Well, the problem is that if your blood pressure is low, Many of the drugs that we use for enlargement of the prostate lower your potential blood pressure, and many patients with MSA and even patients with Parkinson's often cannot tolerate them due to dizziness. So that's very, very important. And again, you can get the urge leakage, overactive bladder, you don't empty very well, and that is a very unique feature of MSA or multisystem atrophy, is not only do you have these bladder spasms, paradoxically, you can have poor emptying, so the bladder just doesn't even empty. So the problem is if you give people relaxants, then you make the poor emptying even worse. And they get more uh, difficult problems such as poor compliance where the bladder wall can't accommodate fluid, the bladder neck is open, uh, you get denervation of the striated sphincter, and you may actually leak with this poor contraction. So it's a whole paradox of uh, changes, much more complicated to deal with, and sometimes um, uh, very difficult to treat in, in the long run. So what about women and uh, urinary symptoms related to Parkinson's disease? What can we do? The first thing is you want to make sure the patients are emptying reasonably well. The usual cause, as I mentioned, is an overactive bladder. And the most important thing is behavioral modification, first-line therapy. We'll talk about that in a minute, what that means. And if that doesn't work, then we can add a bladder relaxant such as an anticholinergic. So remember we mentioned that the nerves that supply the bladder are cholinergic and the medication that we give are those drugs that block those nerves to relax the bladder wall. The new drugs, the Mirabetrix or the beta-3 agonists, they work differently. They stimulate the receptors to relax the bladder as opposed to blocking them. And then there's Botox injection. We'll talk about that as a third-line therapy. Interestingly, I would say that most people we can make better, significantly better in fact. What about men? A little more complicated because you have this prostate. So in younger men, the treatment is similar to women, uh, but as patients get older and their prostate enlarges, then you got to be careful. So there's a whole slew of things that we can do. One is, of course, as always, behavior modification is first-line therapy. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. We can use drugs that open up the prostate or relax the smooth muscle. We can use drugs that shrink the prostate down to open up the urethra. Uh, many of you may not know, but the PD-5 inhibitors, which are the Cialis and Viagra, Cialis comes, which is used for erectile dysfunction, comes in a 5 milligram daily dosing. It's been approved by Health Canada for urinary, ur urinary symptom treatment, and we use that often. It's been available for that problem for about four or five years now. Interestingly, it's not covered by OHIP, so patients have to pay out of the pocket. It can be quite expensive, and that's 
probably the limiting factor. And again, the five milligram dose is quite low, but very expensive. And again, we can combine with the alpha blockers, bladder relaxants, the beta-3 agonists. Um, and on occasion, we use something called vasopressin, which is um, Nocturna is the other name. Interestingly, drug. That drug basically eliminates urine output for 10 hours. It's given at bedtime, used mostly for polyuria. In other words, people make lots of urine at night, not usually used for Parkinson's. And then last of all, Botox. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about each of these options of treatment in a minute. So this is what we're dealing with in a man. Uh, so just imagine in a woman, you don't have this prostate here. So there's no blockage. As you get older, this prostate narrows the passageway, and the bladder doesn't like that, and it can become overactive also. So that's what we're talking about in terms of prostate. So what is behavioral modification? So I always get in trouble for this. Why? So you hear Oprah and you hear Dr. Oz say you should be drinking tons and tons of fluids. Absolutely the wrong thing to do because if you have an overactive bladder, you make that 100% worse. So generally, we recommend the following. We recommend no more than two liters of fluid a day, and that includes soup, salads, cereals, fruits, vegetables, and everything you're drinking. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. One, if you have kidney stones. If you're severely constipated, drinking fluids helps. Caffeine intake. Caffeine, we recommend only one caffeine beverage per day, 8 to 10 ounces. That includes tea, coffee, pop, chocolate. Alcohol makes this worse. We recommend, again, it's a diuretic, as is the caffeine. We recommend not drinking more than one uh, uh, alcoholic beverage at night, usually a, uh, a wine. Problem with uh, beer is that it's a huge volume, and so not only are you drinking alcohol, but you're drinking a huge volume. Salty, spicy foods make you retain fluid, so we recommend watching that. Timing of fluids is very important. If you're getting up three or four times at night, you should not be drinking tons and tons of fluids before bedtime. That makes it worse. Nor should you be taking your diuretic before bedtime to make you pee in the middle of the night. So that's what we're referring to for behavioral modification. Now, what about medical therapy? What drugs do we have available? Well, for patients that have enlargement of the prostate, men, we use something called alpha blockers. So drugs such as Flomax, Rapaflop. The problem with these medications is they cause dizziness and they can lower your blood pressure. Rapaflop, of all the alpha blockers for enlarging the prostate, has been shown to be the least likely to lower blood pressure. So we will use this drug more often than the Flomax itself. Now, what about 5-ARI, so the drugs such as Avidar? The problem is they take three to six months to work. So the drugs such as Proscar, drugs such as Avidart or Finasteride, the other name. And again, they only reduce the size of prostate by 20%, and they can cause sexual dysfunction because they affect uh, the, um, um, the, the, the conversion of testosterone. Now, again, remember we mentioned the PD-5 inhibitors such as Cialis. They are approved for LUTs. And again, Tadalafil, 5 milligrams, or Cialis, 5 milligrams. Minimal side effects, problems not covered and expensive, even though it's generic now. By the way, Costco is the cheapest for all these drugs, generic, then Walmart, and then I would not get any of those drugs at such as uh, Rexall or Shopper's Drug Market. Very, very expensive compared to the other two options. Now, what about the overactive bladder medications? So the concern of using a drug that relaxes the bladder is that it may put the patient into retention. So it's important that patients empty really well. And as you can imagine, with blockage from enlarging the prostate, that is a real concern for us. Botox, which works extremely well, which we inject, and again, I'll show you how we do it. The concern is that it works too well in some people, and especially if you have enlargement of the prostate poor emptying, you can put people into retention, and that's one of the side effects. Some of you may have heard of something called neuromodulation. My two partners here at the Western do neuromodulation, and that is basically putting little tiny wires into the sacral uh, 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 sacrum to send small or low impulses to the nerves, and it controls the bladder. We... Um, We've been interested in this in Parkinson's disease. The problem is 
There's not much data whether you can use it because Parkinson's can be a progressive disease, slowly albeit, and so neuromodulation often will fail with time. And that's why it's not readily used, although some people we still use it. Now, what about enlarging the prostate and OAB, overactive bladder such as Parkinson's? You need to make sure patients are emptying reasonably well. What's reasonably well? They should empty less than 200 cc's as a postoid residual. In other words, if you're walking around with 200 or less in your bladder, even after you urinate, then it's safe to use these dread medication. You can use low-dose bladder relaxants if they're emptying reasonably well. And surprisingly, uh, we used to think that retention was very common. It actually has been shown not to be that common if you follow the rules of making sure they're emptying reasonably well. Usually in patients, I would start an alpha blocker with enlarging the prostate and Parkinson's and then put them on a bladder relaxin. I wouldn't use a bladder relaxin alone in people with enlarged prostate. Now, what about the bladder relaxants in BPH? Well, again, combination therapy of an alpha blocker and bladder relaxants works really well, even in the face of obstruction. Uh, and patients often, if they're emptying reasonably well, don't go into retention. And again, we will use this in combination. I wouldn't use bladder relaxants alone if people have enlargement of the prostate in men. Now, which overactive drug is best for BPH and in women? What can we use as an, what, what are we gonna choose if we decide to give them an overactive medication? Well, there's about 12 of them and they're all reasonable and low doses to start. I think that there's something special about these two, Fesoteridine and Mirabegron. Fesoteridine is Tovias, Mirabegron is Mirabetric. Um, they're not generic. They're the only two that are not generic now. And they have some unique features that I want to discuss. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is fesoteridine? So fesoteridine is Tovias. It is the big brother of detrol or torolteridine, which we rarely use now. The advantage is that you there are two dosages, four to eight milligrams. With tolteridine, there was only four milligrams. It has a more predictable and stable blood levels because it's broken down in the bloodstream as opposed to the liver. There's no, inter, no issues with QT interval, and QT interval can cause arrhythmias. Uh, with, there was some concern with tolteridine. If you bumped up the dose, you can affect the rhythm of the heart. It's not the case with fesoteridine. It's a clean drug. There are surprisingly no cognitive issues in multiple studies, which I'll show you. Even though many geriatricians stop these drugs because they're considered anticholinergics, but it's been shown to be very safe in patients who uh, have um, Alzheimer's, although if there's a concern, we'll, of course, we'll stop it in any, in any case. It's covered by OHIP. It's on the LU code. Excellent product, very effective, and no, I don't get paid for promoting this drug. I just use a lot of it. I think it's really great. There are two well-designed trials, one both by geriatricians um, and uh, one by uh, Adrian Wagg, who's a Canadian in Alberta. Another one is by Catherine Dubois, who is a uh, wonderful physician who I know quite well. And they did two large studies and it showed that fesoteridine is effective and well tolerated in the elderly and even the fragile elderly with no significant cognitive dysfunction. So I like using it in Parkinson's and older patients because it rarely affects mentation and it's a wonderful product. Uh, interestingly, there's something called the Beers criteria. I don't know if any of you know, but it's put up by the American Geriatri Geriatric Society. It looks at drugs that are safe for the elderly, and fesoteridine was the only overactive bladder medication that was found to be safe in the elderly, according to the latest Beers criteria, which I think is about three or four years old now. What about Mirabegron? So Mirabegron is the new kid on the block. It's a beta-3 adrenal receptor agonist. It works by stimulating the smooth muscle of the bladder by relaxing it, and as a result, uh, it doesn't block anything. It actually relaxes the muscle of the bladder so you can accommodate more fluid and uh, don't have the spasm. Very effective. The major advantage of this particular drug is it does not cause dry mouth like the bladder, other bladder relaxants, the anticholinergics, or constipation. And there's been some trials that have shown that it's less of an issue to cause retention. The dose is typically 25 to 50 milligrams. I usually start at 50. Sometimes I'll start at 25 if I'm concerned. There are two potential side effects. One is headache in a small percentage of patients. Uh, 
And then the other issue is that if you have uncontrolled blood pressure problems, if your blood pressure is up and you're not controlled well, the mirabegron could potentially worsen that. So we have to be careful in patients who are not well controlled in terms of their blood pressure. Now, I just put up this. This is a safety uh, comparison of uh, bladder relaxants like tolteridine, which are anticholinergics, and mirabegron, which is the new um, um, uh, beta-3 agonist compared to placebo. And this is interesting. So if you look at dry mouth, placebo and mirabegron are about the same, which we'd expect because it's not a bladder relaxin, compared to 10% in people on an anticholinergic. And similarly with constipation, which doesn't seem to be as bad, placebo and mirabegron are the same. Headache, again, a little more common in mirabegron and surprisingly common in tolterian, although it was never an issue. So if this doesn't work, the oral medication, so if patients fail medical management, which is the most common reason, if they get bladder infections due to obstruction, if they get re recurrent bouts of retention, if they develop bladder stones, if they get recurrent blood in the urine, if they get failure because you're not emptying, or they get worsening leakage in Parkinson MSA because they're not emptying, then, then, and only then, with reluctancy, we may consider a transurethral section of the prostate gland. Obviously, we don't do that in women. And what do we do is we put a telescope in and we shave out the prostate gland to make a nice big channel. Now, there is a downside to this in Parkinson's and even MSA. And the downside is you potentially could make the incontinence worse. So we're often very cautious about offering this to patients. Sometimes if they're in retention, you don't have a choice. Now, what about Botox in men and women? So this is second or third line therapy if they don't have obstruction and if they're emptying reasonably well and if the oral medications don't work. So how does Botox work? So Botox affects the neurotransmitter at the muscle site, both of smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. So as you know, Botox is used for wrinkles. It's used for uh, patients who have spasms in their uh, limbs, very effective and surprisingly, surprisingly very effective in the bladder. And so how do we, how does it work? Well, we basically put a telescope into the bladder and we inject a number of sites in the bladder into the muscle of the bladder of 100 or 200 units of Botox, depending on the patient. And uh, it takes about a week to kick in and can last up to six to nine months. Very effective therapy. There is an increased risk of infection. We don't understand why that's the case, so we watch the patients. And it works so well in some people that there is a risk of retention. Not common. And here is the basic side effect, side effect profile. This, so this, this is a, a long-term study that we published over um, uh, our group uh, in the uh, United States and Canada, looking at the adverse events of using Botox. And you can see that urinary tract infection is not uncommon. We don't understand why because most of the people empty quite well, so you would think that would be a cause. So that's the first thing. And then again, urinary retention, not very common, but is existent, 3.9 and all the way to 2.2 um, after multiple injections. So it does occur, and those are the two main problems that we worry about. So this is my second last slide. So in conclusion, it's very important to make sure that women empty very well. And you can use the overactive bladder medications, such as beta-3 agonists or uh, anticholinergics. And then if uh, patients don't respond to that, then Botox can be a good option, along with behavior modification in all instances. MSA or multisystem atrium, multisystem atrium, you've got to be careful about the emptying, so you've got to be really careful about prescribing all these medications. In men, the enlargement of the prostate confounds treatment. You've got to make sure they're emptying. BPH treatment is needed if needed, and OAB treatment uh, is needed. You can treat the patients, but you've got to be careful to make sure they're emptying. Again, multi-system atrium with the poor emptying may be a problem. I, I can just finish or conclude with the following. We can usually improve things with treatment in most people. Now, this is my last slide. This is my car, leaks. Um, I go to a car wash all the time, and the guy always looks at my license plate and always says to me, I know he wants to ask me something. So one day he asked me, um, are you a plumber? And I said, sort of. Listen, thank you very much for listening. I'll take any questions now.
Dr. Radomsky, thank you so much. So as we begin the question and answer portion of our session, we want to remind everyone that we really value your feedback. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to a short survey. We ask that you please take a few minutes and provide us with your feedback by completing it. Your input is so important to us and it'll help us identify topics of interest for future webinars, as well as help us better meet your needs. And we're going to open the forum up for questions. Um, our first question is, it's a, it's a really good one actually, uh, Dr. Radomsky, what types of tests are typically done to determine if urinary problems are due to PD versus an enlarged prostate? So of course uh, we do a history and physical examination. Uh, that's usually uh, helpful in directing us where to go from there. If, it's, if we're concerned about enlarging the prostate, uh, and it's a simple problem. We may not do any further investigations other than potentially, you know, obviously a rectal examination of PSA. And we may start the medication. If I'm concerned, if I'm worried, if I'm not sure exactly what's going on, there are two things that I will do if they have enlargement of the prostate. Uh, and that is I will look in with a telescope or a cystoscopy, very similar to the picture I showed you, just to make sure that the prostate, bladder, look not abnormal. Sometimes patients, even though they have symptoms of enlargement of the prostate, you look in and the prostate's tiny and that's not the problem. And then the second test is that graph that I show you, the urodynamics, where we test the bladder function and see how bad the spasms are, how well patients empty, if it's due to obstruction, because that's very helpful in the urodynamic studies. We can determine all that. In women, very similar. We'll look into the bladder, make sure there's nothing odd going on. Not as frequently in women, but the urodynamics can be very helpful if we're unsure uh, what's going on. So what's urodynamics? We put one little tube in the bladder, one in the bottom. We fill them up with either contrast or saline. We take pictures on an image or x-ray. We measure the pressures upon filling. We measure the pressures when the patient voids. And we, may, and we see how well they empty and we can take pictures. That gives us the most information that we can determine about voiding dysfunction. Now, interesting, there's only two centers that do this video or x-ray urodynamics uh, in the vicinity in Toronto. One is at Sunnybrook, one is here. There are a couple other sites in London, Ontario, Ottawa, and also in uh, Kingston. Uh, Hamilton also has it available and London, as mentioned, London, Ontario. So it's only available in certain centers, but can be very helpful. It's not necessary to do every single study. Sometimes I'll see a patient, a woman with Parkinson's disease, and they're empty reasonably well, and their symptoms are not that horrific, and I'll put them on behavioral modification and then try them on an overactive bladder medication. That's generally what we do. Okay, thank you. That was excellent. Um, so having said that, uh, our audience is listening in from across Canada. What do you suggest they do if they're looking for a center that does this type of testing? Well, the we're very fortunate here. And I guess over the years, uh, you know, people um, uh, refer us patients because we have a huge Parkinson's clinic here at the Western. Um, Dr. Tony Lang runs it. Uh, we see a lot of patients from St. Mike's. We see a lot of patients from Baycrest Geriatric Center. Uh, Dr. Kleiner is there. So, you know, we you sort of develop a practice where people are free of patients. But what I would suggest is that most of the people who are in the peripheral, the urologist, don't do this super specialized uh, treatment. Doesn't mean they won't see the patient. Doesn't mean they don't do a good job. It just means that if it's a complex issue, and I would generally suggest referring them to, you know, an academic center that has an interest in doing this. And, and of course, we do. And, you know, in London and uh, in Ottawa, Sunnybrook, you know, there's always people who are very interested in doing this. So I would get a referral to that. I think they have available more testing that, that would be helpful for the patient. But not necessarily. If you live far away, it may be worthwhile seeing one of the urologists in the vicinity and they can start at least start treatment or do some simple investigations. Thank you. I have a very good question from one of our participants. Um, she's asking, if a person has Parkinson's disease, 
and also has an autonomic nervous system disorder, nocturnal hypertension, um, supine hypotension. Mm. How does this alter your treatment plan? Well, as I mentioned, with prostate enlargement, it's a bit of an issue because the drugs that we use to open the passageway up, the alpha blockers, they can cause worsening of the hypotension. And even in Parkinson's where patients often have low blood pressure, it can make that worse. So we may be limited in treating the enlargement of the prostate with drugs such as the PD-5 inhibitors like Cialis, which is a bit of an issue because it's not covered uh, and so it's expensive, or using a drug that shrinks the prostate. It may not be optimal. In women, uh, the bladder relaxants uh, don't really have an effect on that, so the overactive bladder medication. And also the beta-3 agonist, which potentially can increase your blood pressure, is of course safe to use. So I think it's just in people with enlarging the prostate, it may be a real issue. Okay, great. Um, we also have another question. Uh, which are the two best treatments? For? Experience? Uh, for Parkinson's? For I no, think <laughs> for the for the um, bladder dysfunction. Yes, bladder dysfunction. So so here here's here's the deal. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many people I see in my office. I saw somebody today who has frequency urgency, not Parkinson's, but free, and they drink six bottles of water. I think behavioral modification is so critical now. There's a problem. In Parkinson's and MSA, patients often have constipation, and the drugs do that make that worse. So you have to find a good balance. So I think behavioral modification is one of the best treatments, and we recommend that for every single patient. I think that uh, you have to sort of pick what you think would be best options. My two go-to drugs for bladder relaxants, if they're emptying quite well, is either Tovies or Mirabetric. I have to admit I use more Mirabetric because the dry mouth is a real issue with some patients, and especially if you're on tons of medications for your MS, MSA and Parkinson's. So those are the two drugs that I use. Okay. Botox is an excellent third-line therapy when they fail those options. We do one or two Botox a day when we're doing our urodynamic studies, and often it's in patients, female patients with uh, Parkinson's. So I think would say those three are the are the two, I can't say two, but I would say those three are the optimal treatment along, which isn't a drug, behavioral modification, which is so critical. I mean, if you drink six cups of coffee, it's a simple fix by reducing that. If you drink, you know, half a bottle of wine at night, that's a simple fix. Not, not so simple. You got to cut it back. But, and also if you drink, you know, five bottles of water, then that's a simple thing. You don't have to take pills for that. So you're saying address the the simple things first, the things yes, that you absolutely. can change immediately, and then see where that takes you. Right, and and you know many patients you know are relu very reluctant to take drugs, a because they're on tons of medication in the first place. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good approach. Yeah, I think so too. Excellent. So a couple of uh, questions popped up um, just as you were speaking on those notes. So one of them is, is constipation relieved by medications that cause retention of fluids? Um, say that again. <laughs> is constipation relieved by the medications that cause retention of fluids with the bladder dysfunction? No, no. In fact, the bladder relaxants such as the anticholinergics like mm -hmm. like Tovias or uh, Tolteridine or Vesicare or Sulfenacin, they can cause worsening of the constipation. The Mirabetric does not, but it doesn't relieve it. So Mirabetric sort of neutral. The other drugs can potentially make it worse. Drinking lots of fluids theoretically will help constipation, but may make your urinary symptoms worse. So we got to find a nice balance, you know, where the patient isn't constipated and yet they're not going so frequently because you're drinking tons and tons of fluids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, again, along similar lines, is uh, we have a uh, participant who's asking, is Botox used only for enlarged prostates? No, no, no. So Botox is used for overactive bladder, and we will use it in women who fail the oral medical therapy who empty quite well. So the first criteria is they have to have failed medication, oral medication. Two, they have to empty quite well. It's not common that we'll use Botox in somebody who has 
overactive bladder, plus they have enlargement of the prostate because the worry is that you're going to put them into retention. So on occasion we'll do it, but we have to make sure they're emptying quite reasonably well because the Botox works extremely well, and you don't want to put them into retention if they have a blockage. So it's not very commonly used if people have enlargement of the prostate. Uh, usually we'll use it in men who are younger or men who have already had a prostate operation so they don't have a blockage. Okay. Um, another question. Are there any other conditions that cause bladder spasms other than Parkinson's disease? Tons. So, in fact, if you look at idiopathic overactive bladder, so what's that? There was a study done in the United States and in Europe uh, that looked over 40,000 people that asked about overactive bladder without any neurological condition, and they found that in uh, about 17% of people have an overactive bladder. It increases with age. It is, so in other words, we can't find a reason where it's not neurological. It increases with age. It's more common in women in younger age groups, but then becomes more common in men as they get older as opposed to women because the prostate gland enlarges and causes blockage. Things like Alzheimer's, mini strokes, strokes, uh, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, multi, uh, MS can all cause overactive bladder where you lose this dysfunction or control of this center, the PMC or pontine micturation center because the higher levels in the brain. So it's not just Parkinson's disease. It's very common. And in fact, all day long I did that today. <laughs> <laughs> so it, what happens when you've got comorbidities? You have Parkinson's disease. The problem is the problem. So if you've had a stroke, if you've had Parkinson's, mm -hmm. if you are a woman who had overactive bladder before you developed Parkinson's, all these things just make it worse. Um, and so, so the overactivity, we have special terminology. So the overactivity occurs in Parkinson's we call neurogenic overactivity. If it's due to the fact that a young woman comes in our office and has the symptoms, it's idiopathic. We don't have a neurological reason for it. So okay. it's, it's very common, actually, overactive bladder. But like I said, 17% of the population in two clinical trials, one in the United States and one in Canada, and also in Europe. So 40,000 patients. That's, that's a large segment. So the, the results based on the methodology should be fairly accurate then. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I've got another question. Uh, one of our participants wants to know, would you use Mirabegron for nocturnal urinary frequency? Absolutely, because it, it calms the bladder down. So people always ask me, and which is in, interesting, is why do I get up more at nighttime and then during the day I'm not so bad? So that's a really good question, isn't it? So why shouldn't it be the same during the day at night? The answer is very simple. When you lie flat, you make more urine. So it may affect you more. Second issue is that as you get older, two-thirds of what you take in during the daytime comes out at night because all the fluid in your tissues, so I'm standing all day long, my legs get a little bit swollen, and then when I lie down at night, all that fluid goes back into my bloodstream and I'm peeing like a racehorse in the middle of the night. So I avoid drinking caffeine, I avoid drinking coffee, I make sure I don't drink tons before I go to bed. You know, we all get older, unfortunately. So that's that's the reason that we can use these drugs, because it helps that. But that's the reason some people get up more frequently at nighttime, That's more, and it's also more troublesome when you can't sleep, as opposed to during the day. You know, you just go to the bathroom yeah. during the day. Yeah, so it's a most real, people aren't real aware of it during the day. They don't count yeah. how many times they go. Yeah. 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 So another thought, um, with the Botox, you said there's a higher uh, risk of bladder infections. Yes. Okay. Having said that, are there any studies that show that this occurs with people who have had a history of UTIs previously? That is a really good question. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, the <laughs> it's a good question. So, and in fact, a very, very um, interesting question because there have been studies that have looked at this and you would think that with the patients who went into retention during the Botox trials, they would have a higher risk of infection and that is simply not the case. It's interesting. And so does it put you at greater risk? So one of the criteria for, one of the contraindications doing Botox is uh, 
untreated infections and people who have recurrent urinary tract infections. It's a theoretical risk. I don't think there's any really good trials, at least I don't know of any. I'm always reluctant, although some people are so desperate uh, you know, to have treatment because the Botox works and they get infections, they're willing to try it. But it's a really good question. I, I would say if I saw somebody who was getting four or five infections per year, I usually make sure they're nice and clear. We do repeat cultures, and then I would inject them with Botox. But it, it's something that you've got to be really careful they don't get uh, worsening UTIs. And also, if they do after Botox, then I won't re-inject them at a later date. Okay. Okay. Um, here's another one. Are there any exercises that will assist in bladder control? Oi, oi. <laughs> so I get in a lot of trouble for this. So I've been doing this for a long time, since the late 80s. And you can do Kegel exercises till the cows come home. It ain't going to help. Mm -hmm. The good news is, and I'm probably going to get a lot of slack for this, the good news is it ain't going to do any harm. So the problem is that they've done you know, studies where they look at patients who have spinal cord injury and they look at this muscle in the urethra and these people have neurogenic spasticity of that muscle and they see that the, when they do an MRI they see that muscle is huge. When you do patients and they've done trials where they've done a thousand Kegel exercises every three minutes, I'm exaggerating of course, and they do <laughs> MRIs in these patients the muscle looks identical to the pre-Kegel exercises. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. So if you have somebody who is got urinary incontinence because of stress leakage, <clears throat> and it's quite mild, Kegel exercises, which are not terribly effective, but pelvic physiotherapy, seeing an actual physiotherapist and learning which muscles to squeeze properly, has been shown, clearly been shown, and very common in Europe, to help that. It's not so clear in overactive bladder. And then it makes sense because why would it, you know, overactive bladder respond to Kegel exercises? But it definitely with stress and it may be very helpful. I'm not a big fan. It doesn't do any harm. Uh, if patients want to do it, I, I'm not critical. Sometimes we'll refer a patient to pelvic physiotherapist and it can be helpful. The problem is that pelvic physiotherapy is time consuming and costly. And that's the problem. Okay. Now you mentioned there were two sphincters on the bladder. Yes. One made of one made of a striated muscle, right? Yes. And one smooth muscle. Right. The medications that you mentioned are at, you know basically targeted towards the smooth muscle or the Correct. striated the bladder neck. The so, bladder neck. So that's interesting because there is very few medications that affect the sphincter downstream, the one that you can stop when you urinate and you want to get to the phone. There are very few drugs that actually affect that. But the smooth muscle, which is under not voluntary control, is affected by drugs such as alpha blockers, which block the sympathetic nerves and relax the bladder neck. Very effective. So that's what we use for enlargement of the prostate because it relaxes the muscle in the prostate and bladder neck. It's a great so question. Does that have an overall effect systemically on other smooth muscle in the body? No. Well, I shouldn't say that. So the answer is yes, because obviously people get dizziness. And so, yes, so there's three things that the alpha block or side effects that they do. One is um, they can cause dizziness, as you know. Two, because they lower the blood pressure, because they're alpha blockers. Two is they can cause nasal stuffiness. And three, they cause something called retrograde ejaculation. So when people orgasm, males at least, they get very little fluid coming out. It goes away as soon as you stop the medication. Sometimes it's quite uh, uh, worrisome in some patients, but usually goes away as soon as you stop the medication. So that's a very good point. And we know that ED or erectile dysfunction um, does occur with Parkinson's disease. Um, so then the question is, are, are there any, you know, uh, resulting negative results as a result of uh, retrograde ejaculation? No, there's no problem. It's just it's a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> <for my patients. laughs> so sure if you don't be. warn them, you say, and then they come back and say, Doc, you know, all of a sudden I don't have any semen coming out. And then you calm them down. You tell them that this is very common with the medication. And mm -hmm. it occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of people. Some of the alpha blockers are worse than the others. So the drugs such as Flomax and Rapaflo, 
more commonly do it. A drug called alfusacin or Zatrol doesn't cause it as readily. So it depends on if it's a problem, then we switch them. All the alpha blockers are equally effective in helping the urinary symptoms. It's a matter of side effect profile that we choose one or the other. Okay. And uh, we've got another question from a male participant who asks, are there differences whether you pee standing or sitting? It's a very good question. So uh, it depends on your preference. If, you're in the, if you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and it's dark, probably sitting is better than standing. You may hit the toilet bowl and, or the seat. So mm -hmm. I, I'm being sarcastic, of course. I, th I think the, the, there's, no, there's no problem with sitting and urinating. Because most men, when they have a bowel movement, may actually urinate sitting. And if you urinate standing, it's not a problem. So it's not an issue. It, it Usually when people sit, it suggests that they're having increasing, all the time, increasing difficulty urinating. But not always. So to me, it's not a big deal. I don't usually ask whether they sit or stand when they urinate. But those are the two important things. That that sometimes when uh, they sit, uh, they have if they do it all the time, it's an increasing problem emptying. Mm -hmm. There have been yeah, studies, actually, yeah. that have shown that sitting is a more effective way to urinate, believe it or not. Um, although patients will tell you standing is much easier. Gravity. Right. Gravity, yes. And um, if it's a, if the patient is elderly, stand, uh, sitting um, so Maybe obviously easier. more comfortable. Yeah. yeah. You don't want um, people to fall in the middle of the night going to the bathroom. That's the other issue, too. Exactly. Exactly. Now... Thinking about sitting, um, is that squatting position more helpful if the person, let's say, is uh, uh, is also constipated because of the the positioning? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't think so, to be honest. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, at what point is a TERP or TERP necessary? So, as I mentioned, there there are. Um, I can, if you want, I can go back and show you. I can just pull it up and then we can, I don't know, that'd be helpful. But for example, if patients aren't emptying, I have a whole slide on that. Sorry, guys, I apologize. Here, I think it's this one here. So failed medical management, most common reason. If they get recurrent bladder infections due to obstruction, poor emptying, retention, bladder stones, uh, they keep get, getting blood in the urine. If they get renal failure because they're not emptying, and then sometimes worsening leakage in Parkinson's. But the ones above are the most common. So basically, if you're not emptying well and you're getting infections and bladder stones and it's affecting your kidney function, that's a reason for doing a TERP. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think we've got most of our questions answered. So why don't we wind things down? Thank you so much. Um, to our audience members, just a reminder to please look for our email in the survey uh, in your inboxes sometime next week. Again, Parkinson Canada really values your feedback, so please complete the post-webinar survey when you do get it. Um, and on behalf of Parkinson Canada, I want to thank you, Dr. Radomsky, for an excellent presentation and a really... Uh, really good banter that we've had here with the Q&A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also want to thank our event sponsor, Synovian, as well as everyone online for participating in today's webinar and for supporting us in bringing you the conversations you want and need. For more information on incontinence and voiding dysfunction in Parkinson's or to access a recording of this webinar, please visit our website at www.parkinson.ca. If you have any further questions regarding today's session, feel free to contact us by email at info at parkinson.ca or call us toll free at 1-800-565-3000. And soon enough, we'll have a whole new webinar series for you in 2019 and the list will be published on our website, so look for it very early in the new year. And as we sign off, we at Parkinson Canada would like to wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and a very happy and safe holiday season. Thank you very much for joining us.